to, but then I, I was going to. But then I All right, so uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome to the Canadian HIV Hepatitis C Management and Treatment Guidelines Symposia. I'm Curtis Cooper, and uh, these are the rest of the panelists who I will introduce shortly. So, as a bit of a background, the, we have had a working group in Canada for the last several years for HIV hepatitis C co-infection that has been organized through the CIHR Canadian HIV uh, Trials uh, Network. And we have uh, published two uh, updated versions of the guidelines, one about two years ago and one in uh, January in the Canadian Journal of Infectious Diseases and Medical Microbiology. Okay. Because of the very rapid uh, progress in hepatitis C treatment, it has uh, become necessary to update these guidelines to reflect what is current standard of care and what will soon be standard of care. Uh, so uh, I, uh, we've, we've done a similar format before where each of us over the next 90 minutes or so will go through each recommendation, the panel will discuss any issues that need to be discussed, and then there'll be an opportunity for the audience to uh, provide any feedback, okay? There are cards on your tables. If you have questions, comments, feedback that you'd prefer to just funnel up to the, the front table, please do so, okay? Um, there are microphones uh, throughout the room, and the Heiko will be running around with the microphone if you, uh, if you uh, want to contribute. I also want you to take note of uh, this website. The draft guidelines will be posted likely within the next week, and they will be there until the end of May for any interested stakeholder to provide feedback, either by comments or by editing, which the working group will consider. I can't promise we're going to implement everything that you think should be in there, but we will definitely uh, give it uh, honest and fair consideration. Okay. Here's a little bit of background. October 2011, the working group was established. The first consensus guidelines were published in December of 2013. The second consensus guidelines was published in January. Uh, we uh, circulated a preliminary draft within our group in April of the guidelines, uh, which brings us to right now, uh, where we're presenting the draft guidelines to you for uh, your feedback. Um, and hopefully, well, by June 1st, we'll, uh, we'll end the, our feedback period. And then we'll finalize the, uh, the guidelines and, and the current plan is to submit uh, to the Canadian Journal of Infectious Disease and Medical Microbiology. This will be followed as with the previous guidelines with knowledge translation activities. This is the working group. Uh, Lisa Barrett from Dalhousie. Brian Conway was not able to be with us today, but he's um, contributed to, to this. Uh, there's me. Pierre Jaguer from uh, the Ottawa Hospital, Mark Hall, who's the co-lead on uh, this uh, guidelines from the Center of Excellence, uh, Marina Klein from McGill, Steve Schaffron from U of Alberta, uh, Alice from U of Toronto, and uh, Alex Wong from the Regina Coppell Health uh, Region. So uh, I want to acknowledge the contribution that, uh, that the group has put into this. It's really already has been uh, a considerable amount of time and effort put in by the, the writers. Want to acknowledge the CIHR for a dissemination events grant, which has helped in part to uh, support this event today. Uh, the CIHR CTN, which has helped with the posting of the uh, other guidelines for knowledge translation activities and all the other sort of logistical supports. Uh, CAR for their support uh, uh, for this, and uh, as well as our uh, partners uh, from industry, AbV, BMS, Gilead, and Merck, who are all kind enough to uh, uh, contribute to the development of these uh, guidelines with unrestricted grants. Um, specifically, I want to thank uh, and acknowledge a couple of people from the uh, CHR, uh, CTN, who have really uh, uh, helped us out, as well as uh, the uh, research assistant of mine, Dave Mackey, who's helped with all the formatting, as well as uh, Aaron and Andrew from CAR. OK, 
Okay, so we have now arrived at the recommendation part of our talk. Each recommendation um, is, uh, is uh, classified according to this scale. There's a class scale of one, two, and three. Um, one would be conditions for which there is evidence or general agreement that a given diagnostic evaluation procedure or treatment benefit is useful and effectiveness. Three would be the opposite, that it's actually ineffective. We also are trying to, uh, that's the class, and then there's a grade of evidence. A, there's multiple randomized clinical trials or meta-analyses in support of the recommendation. B, there's one randomized trial or no randomized studies. And C, uh, it's because uh, a group of pointy-headed experts think that it sounds like a good idea. Okay. Okay. So we're now uh, on to the uh, epi section. So I'm going to ask Mark to, uh, to, to present these. With, which, with each recommendation, we'll discuss it. If discussion is required amongst the, the board, then we'll see if there's any uh, comments from the audience. Keep in mind there's 50 of these. So we need to spend time talking about the ones where there really is controversy, where the ones where there isn't, we really need to move on. Um, I want to try and give everyone an opportunity to contribute, but I hope you'll understand that at some points uh, in the next little while, we're going to have to just shut it down and move on to the next one. Okay. Uh, thanks, Curtis. So as Curtis mentioned, we've really divided our guidelines into a number of uh, key sections, the first being epidemiology, which is fairly straightforward and hopefully won't be too controversial, uh, looking at HIV management in the setting of co-infection, and then I think we hope to spend the meat of the discussion actually talking about some of the hepatitis C treatment recommendations as the field for treatment has evolved so rapidly since our last guidelines, and Steve and the other uh, uh, group members will take you through some of the evidence behind uh, the clinical trials that have guided our recommendations in that regard. So these first ones hopefully should be fairly controversial because they really deal with screening and testing, uh, which is uh, a fairly straightforward statement we think we can make, uh, which is to say basically all patients or pa persons living with HIV should undergo screening for hepatitis C at time of, of diagnosis or time of first clinical uh, care. Um, and it, at, for individuals who remain at risk, uh, either through injection drug use, uh, uh, incarcerated individuals, uh, and uh, one of the more uh, novel recommendations now is for HIV positive MSM, so men who have sex with men, uh, screening should be repeated uh, on uh, a semi-regular basis uh, if they remain at risk for infection. The second point on our slide here, looking at MSM, is one certainly that we'd be open to having a conversation about. Uh, this is based on some mathematical models uh, that have looked at uh, ideal sequencing and timing of, of testing uh, due to the risk for sexual transmission of hepatitis C in that population. And basically, they recommend, in combination with regular liver enzyme panels every six months, that hepatitis C antibodies should be considered uh, as a means of uh, diagnosing uh, hepatitis C infection. So Panelists, do we agree with the six-month recommendation? Dr. Schaffrin? <laughs> well, it really, I mean, it depends on a risk. It's hard to generalize uh, risk, and the issue, too, depends on the population, certainly with an injection drug-using population, absolutely. Uh, with an MSM population, it really depends on, on e local epidemiology. So the large, many of the large cities in the world have this epidemic. Many of the smaller ones do not. On the other hand, uh, people uh, do visit uh, other places and, and bring back infections. So it's, it's hard to, I think it's hard to make a generalization. Uh, the other issue is how frequently one identifies uh, a hep C infection uh, in, by antibody that you wouldn't have uh, run the test had, on the basis of an ALT that you, were, you might be monitoring for their routine yeah. HIV care. And, and uh, certainly in our experience, it, it, would be rare, it would be rare, but not never, that you would uh, pick it up without a clue from yeah. the ALT. I, I agree. I think a lot of our diagnoses in this population are made on ALT elevation as well. But it's actually uh, very helpful, I think, sometimes to have had a sequence of antibody tests before so you can actually time the seroconversion a bit more uh, uh, closely. This was very important in the era when we were using PEG and Cefiro and Rabovirin for therapy because their acute hepatitis C would just mm -hmm. clearly able to respond uh, more effectively. I mean, you responded better in that setting. Whether that's going to apply now in the era of, M of DAAs is it may not be quite so, uh, quite so important to actually know the timing of, of infection. Um, 
So I think, Marina? Just, just briefly, I think the other issue that's raised is that clearly we can't generalize that all MSM populations are equally potentially at risk. So, and, and that may be a conversation that has to happen between the clinician and the patient with regarding to assessing uh, whether there's ongoing uh, exposure, unprotected exposure outside a stable partnership. Uh, and then the no situations where I think it becomes much more yes, important I to agree. consider this. I think definitely that's an uh, important conversation to have. Should we open it to the floor? I can't actually see anybody's hand, so. Okay. <laughs> and, no, so next. It might just be the blinding light or, or lack of questions, but we'll see. Can I just ask one other small thing, just in regards to the, the mention of Aboriginal populations? It is, again, I mean, has been discussed, it's hard to generalize for all Aboriginal populations that they're at high risk, per se, and I think an individualized discussion is valuable to help determine risk and how often we should be screening. Uh, a motherhood statement, as you can see, level C in terms of its uh, uh, greater recommendation, is basically the point of performing uh, screening is to identify co-infection, which provides an opportunity uh, uh, to uh, counsel with regards to transmission risk, uh, risk reduction in terms of alcohol use or other, other uh, factors that could affect liver health, and obviously now uh, linkage to care uh, for hepatitis C therapy and linkage to care for harm reduction services uh, if uh, required. Uh, so I think a fairly general statement that we're, that we're making there at that point. Okay, uh, I think to move things along, uh, I'm going to move on now and touch on the setting of management of HIV and the setting of co-infection. Part of this is also going to defer uh, down to, to my colleagues at the end of the table when we look at drug-drug interactions with some of the, the new recommendations and, and those recommendations for the most part will be discussed by them. Uh, but uh, one of the uh, statements that we, we're endorsing is uh, the consideration of uh, initiation of antiretroviral therapy as a means to slow disease progression in co-infected patients. Uh, we uh, know, and I'll show you some data for this that, uh, uh, on our next slide, that antiretroviral therapy can uh, slow down the risk of progression of, of de liver disease and decompensation, and as such, early initi initiation of antiretroviral therapy is recommended clearly uh, for their HIV care in patients with CD4s less than 500, but we also recommend consideration of antiretroviral therapy in individuals with CD4s above 500 if hepatitis C therapy is not imminently to be undertaken. Um, obviously, if you're going to initiate antiretroviral therapy, you have to ensure that you've had a, a very good con conversation with regards to barriers to adherence, counseling uh, regarding uh, virologic suppression and the need for, for long-term uh, uh, adherence to medications. Uh, finally, one statement, just in case people don't read the rest of the guidelines, uh, as we move into the era of some of the new uh, DAA-based regimens, we have to be uh, cognizant of the fact that uh, one of the combinations that we're going to be discussing down the road actually includes uh, ritonavir uh, boosting, and as such, if you're going to use that particular hepatitis C uh, DAA-based regimen, uh, you have to initiate antiretroviral therapy uh, uh, to, to avoid the risk of inducing uh, resistance due to ritonavir monotherapy monotherapy. So the evidence uh, uh, has been strengthened in this regard uh, by a presentation or publication from the Veterans Affairs Cohort. Uh, this looked at over 10,000 uh, co-infected individuals, and they looked at hepatic decompensation events in people who had initiated antiretroviral therapy compared to those who had not started antiretroviral therapy. And clearly, uh, here we see uh, very uh, large observational data supporting the use of, of uh, antiretroviral therapy, which reduced the risk of hepatic decompensation by a range of 28 to 41 percent. So I think really gives us a very nice strengthening observational data uh, to support these recommendations. Our final recommendations uh, with regards to uh, antiretroviral therapy is uh, our most, or I should say, all current recommended antiretroviral regimens uh, are thought to be well tolerated in the setting of co-infection and are uh, equally effective in co-infected compared to mono-infected <coughs> patients uh, and uh, can be considered for use uh, in, in all individuals. Um, the other recommendation, particularly as we move now into the era where we have very short course DAA-based therapy, uh, is that hepatitis C therapy could actually be considered prior to antiretroviral therapy in patients with very high CD4 counts uh, in order to remove the risk of drug-drug uh, interactions and perhaps uh, decrease the risk of antiretroviral-related hepatotoxicity in patients who've undergone successful clearance of their hepatitis C, uh, which is based on some small studies in, in Spain. So that's the end of this section. 
uh, I think I'll open it to the panel again, uh, and then we can see if the audience has any comments, but otherwise I think we want to move on to the actual treatment section. Okay, the panel, <coughs> the panel is in agreement. <laughs> any uh, comments from the audience? Okay. So the, the next section that we're going to cover pertains to baseline evaluation and management of hepatitis C now in this context of co-infection. Um, and these, again, should be fairly straightforward. I think it's quite clear that patients with confirmed hepatitis C antibody should be evaluated with a HCV PCR to determine whether there's actually chronic infection is present. We know that approximately uh, up to 20 percent, probably closer to 15 percent in a setting of co-infection will spontaneously clear infection and may be antibody positive but not chronically infected currently. Uh, and those who have a positive HCV RNA should undergo HCV genotyping. Again, this is important for classification of future uh, uh, hepatitis C therapies in particular. It also has some prognostic uh, considerations for fibrosis progression. Um, those who have a negative HCV RNA, we are recommending that they should undergo repeat testing <laughs> to confirm uh, spontaneous clearance. Uh, th that's to say, we can know that the, our level, all uh, PCR-based uh, assays have a, s a threshold for detection, and it has been observed that people can fluctuate uh, just above the limit of detection. And so should we actually observe on one occasion that someone is PCR negative, it's worthwhile to confirm that with a sec subsequent observation to confirm that the spont clearance is actually uh, present. Um, pa all patients who should also undergo screening for other viral hepatitis, uh, particularly hepatitis A and B, which are vaccine preventable, uh, and should be offered vaccination if they're found to be non-immune. I should say we haven't put it, uh, I realized just now today reading these, uh, that we haven't put a recommendation with respect to uh, PCR assays uh, and the frequency we should repeat them among people who've been treated. And I think that's something we may consider adding to the guidelines uh, in that it's become no longer standard of care to, uh, in most clinical settings, to allow repeated HCV PCR analyses to be done outside the context of HCV treatment. And I think we will miss the possibility of detecting reinfections if we don't monitor at some frequency thereafter. And I think that might be something we can discuss towards the end of, of the day today. In terms of clinical assessments, um, I think we need to consider that patients should be evaluated for other conditions that can impact chronic liver disease. Uh, and in particular, the one that affects our populations quite importantly is alcohol use and abuse. Um, we are recommending that all patients should be counseled regarding their alcohol use and to uh, consider abstinence, if possible, or certainly alcohol reduction. The level of evidence with respect to the impact of alcohol on uh, liver fibrosis and risk of cirrhosis is uh, indisputable when it's uh, high and at the levels of abuse. Uh, whether or not low levels of alcohol exposure are themselves uh, uh, detrimental has yet to be proven, uh, but I think we all would agree that uh, co uh, concomitant cofactors will uh, be uh, important. And particularly, this is, should continue even after treatment or spontaneous clearance because uh, damage to the liver can persist. Now we're in an era where we can non-invasively monitor liver fibrosis, uh, and so uh, we realize that liver biopsies have pretty much fallen uh, out of use uh, you know, across the country and in most developed settings that have access to non-invasive measures, including transient elastography or fiber scan or use of laboratory markers. Um, liver biopsy may have a place when you're trying to look at other etiologies of liver disease, but um, it's important to realize that ALT alone, that is a liver enzyme, correlates poorly with objective measures of liver fibrosis, and that we shouldn't be relying on ALT 
criteria alone to determine the need for treatment initiation in co-infected patients. The, the, the extreme example of this is in someone who has cirrhosis, advanced cirrhosis, they frequently have normal or low ALT levels. There's no longer any uh, hepatocytes that present that are actively able to be inflamed and produce ALT. Um, and clearly, we need to have other measures that are more objective to assess the level of fibrosis when we're determining who should be prioritized for treatment. Um, we uh, recommend baseline abdominal ultrasound should be considered in all patients, at least one, and this may be something that will come up for discussion on the panel. Maybe I'll stop there and see, because I think there were some panel members so, who did not. I mean, that's certainly debatable that we need uh, a baseline ultrasound. Uh, unlike hepatitis B, it's highly unusual for uh, somebody without cirrhosis to develop uh, liver cancer due to hepatitis C. So, you know, in my experience, uh, a lot of ultrasounds are done with uh, without any actual uh, useful clinical right. findings. Right. You know, we, we were in the habit of doing baseline ultrasounds on all our hepatitis C patients from years ago in the era where our only uh, measure of fibrosis was biopsy, and sometimes the ultrasound would give us enough information that we didn't have to biopsy because you would occasionally pick up a patient with overt evidence of cirrhosis and therefore a biopsy wasn't needed. Uh, but in, in more recent years, since we've now had a fibro scan at our clinic just over three years, as long as we get a satisfac technically satisfactory fibro scan, which you can do in about 95% of patients, and if we're, we're completely satisfied that it's not cirrhotic, then we've moved away from doing routine um, uh, ultrasounds. Obviously, if you do ultrasounds in everybody, you may pick up the so-called incidental loma, you know, you know, something in their kidney or whatever, but you wouldn't, it, it's pretty hard to justify doing ultrasound if you have a good fibrosis assessment. Okay. Any other panel comments? I think the, the rationale be behind including it was in the previous versions of the guidelines were that we didn't have routine availability of fibrous scan, and I actually would say to date that's still the case in a lot of centers across Canada. Um, picking up other abnormalities, uh, portal hypertension and splenomegaly without having a fibrosis a measure would, I mean, it would be unlikely to find them solely on ultrasound and not have any evidence of that objectively elsewhere. Um, I think the one issue that we don't address at all and perhaps is a consideration is the presence of fatty liver disease, and that's something that, it, while ultrasound is insensitive, can actually give, provide you with some uh, evidence for the case if you don't have that. So I, I think perhaps this is a softer recommendation, but we could recommend that it be considered, particularly uh, in the setting where there is no available availability of uh, other measures, of uh, non-invasive measures for fibrosis assessment. And the other thing, which is important, however, is that anyone who is determined to have a significant fibrosis or cirrhosis, I should say, by fibro scan should undergo an ultrasound in order to screen for hepatocellular carcinoma at that point. Are there any comments from the audience on this matter? No hepatologists in the audience. <laughs> Phew. Okay, and now we'll move on to non-invasive fibrosis assessments. So um, we uh, strongly recommend that a baseline evaluation of liver fibrosis be made for all patients, and there is a number of ways to carry this out. Uh, I think, by and large, the most commonly used measure at the present time is FibroScan or transient elastography or some variation of that. There's different radiologic techniques that have been developed. Fibro test, which is a combination of blood tests, or APRI, uh, or FIB4, which is another marker that's been used uh, to determine the degree of hepatic fibrosis. And finally, uh, evaluation of liver fibrosis with liver biopsy can be considered if non-invasive measures of determining fibrosis are not available or if you're considering an alternative diagnosis that must be assessed. And this can, for example, be uh, NASH or other uh, toxic uh, uh, effects on the liver. Uh, once, as I mentioned, a, a patient is identified to have cirrhosis, um, this is very important, and I think uh, uh, we published uh, evidence from the Canadian Co-Infection Cohort study that we actually do a rather poor job of this, that uh, we are missing opportunities to de detect liver cancer among our patients, that uh, uh, screening for hepatocellular carcinoma should occur every six months. Now, this is the guideline we've put in. I think there's some controversy or 
debate amongst in the mono infection literature about the interval of screening, whether it needs to be six months or one year. Uh, some of that also depends on what the availability of these tests are in your institutions in terms of timing, but it's clear that it should be regular and um, I would say, and I would like to hear what the panel members think about the interval of screening, but certainly no less than once per year, but once every six months, is that a strong? Even the uh, I mean, uh, the guidelines, most guidelines still say six months. Um, it's a pragmatic issue of, of availability of ultrasound spaces, and it's off, you know, if you can get one done a year, you're, you're lucky. But there's also the, you know, if you're uh, for some, you know, it's a, it's another trip for a patient to have to try and, mm -hmm. and arrange. So, mm -hmm. sure. one other nuance is that if a if a patient with hepatitis C cirrhosis is treated successfully mm -hmm. successfully with antivirals and gets viral eradication, they are at reduced, but they're still at some residual risk of liver cancer. And if you were then looking at your resources, I'd be more inclined to more frequently treat those who are still viremic. Mm -hmm. yeah than those who have been virologically cured, but I still think we need to screen those virologically cured. Those might be better candidates for once a year and the others perhaps six months, but now we're venturing heavily into opinion evidence. Yeah, no, that's an excellent point, Stephen. I think we actually should specifically add a mention of that, that screening should continue irrespective of whether someone has been successfully treated to date, although we see evidence that the rates of hepatocellular carcinoma are likely reduced following uh, uh, sustained virologic response. They clearly do not go down to the baseline rates, at least immediately, and probably not for some time, and that screening should continue. I think from an opinion point, when you look at the co-infection cohort and how badly we did it actually doing this, you recommend every once a year, then once a year is going to turn actually yeah, practically I think, I think into every that, two years, and mm, at least yeah. if you do it every six months, as Curtis has said, it's yeah. going to happen at least once a year, yeah. which I think is very important. Yeah. Uh, and we should have a nuance between treat and untreated. Okay, good. Great. And then finally, patients who have underlying cirrhosis should also be considered for gastroscopy to screen for esophageal varices because these are, again, treatable in terms of banding or other procedures that could reduce the risk of fatal uh, esophageal hemorrhage. That's it? Yeah. Is that me? Okay, thank you. All right. Okay. Now we're getting into the meat. <laughs> okay, I'm not actually the meat here, uh, so I'm just going to go through the three slides relatively quickly, and uh, then we'll get to the meat, which is Steve and Lisa. I want to thank uh, Curtis and uh, Mark for giving me the chance to participate on the guideline committee. So. Hopefully these are all relatively straightforward, non-controversial recommendations. Uh, we recommend all co-infected patients should undergo evaluation for and uh, evaluation of candidacy for hepatitis C uh, therapy. And uh, in regards to preparing patients or evaluating patients for their candidacy, it's important to look at substance abuse, addictions issues, mental health issues, and housing and food security. Uh, Addiction is not an absolute exclusion uh, criteria for hepatitis C therapy, regardless uh, of uh, whether we were in the interferon era or now the interferon-free era. And multidisciplinary care is recommended to optimally support patients as they progress through workup and subsequent treatment. Moving on. So, um, for the small number of patients for whom interferon will still be used, uh, a detailed assessment in regards to interferon-related uh, contraindications is still recommended and uh, important. And lastly, it is important um, uh, for appropriate levels of funding for hepatitis C treatment programs and removal of barriers uh, for hepatitis C antiviral therapy to optimize engagement in care and treatment outcomes. So I guess the reminder that adherence is still crucial, um, even if it's 8 to 24 weeks, um, and even though things are much uh, better now in the interferon-free era, that we still can't forget that barriers may exist for patients such that adherence may not be uh, optimal. Now we'll get to the meat. There, of course, was a vegetarian option for lunch. <laughs> exactly. Or meat-free options, okay. depending on your preference. 
So, uh, good day, ladies and gentlemen. I've been asked to talk about recommendations of the panel for hepatitis C genotype 1. So, as a reminder, hepatitis C is, is typed into six major genotypes uh, worldwide. Genotype 1 is the most prevalent on a global basis, and it is the most prevalent in Canada, where in Canada it, it constitutes uh, two-thirds of all cases of hepatitis C, and it might uh, constitute a slightly higher proportion in the co-infected uh, population. So I'll be talking specifically about the genotype 1 guidelines in the next couple of minutes. Uh, just to let you know, the data that are available with inter entirely interferon-free uh, therapy in HIV, uh, hepatitis C genotype 1 co-infected individuals uh, are listed on this slide with four regimens of which I'll show you data with two because the uh, uh, the two regimens listed on the on the bottom are not uh, currently uh, approved by Health Canada uh, so I will be showing you the data with uh, sofosbuvir, lidipasvir and also with the uh, um, the paratapravir, ombitasvir, ritonavir, disabuvir, ribavirin regimen oh, yeah Okay, so, um, and then we'll show you the recommendations. So the largest data set available to date on treating uh, hepatitis C with interferon-free therapy in a co-infected population comes from the ION4 trial, uh, with, which enrolled 335 uh, uh, participants, of which all but eight had genotype 1. There were eight patients in with genotype 4. They all achieved an SVR. And the overall SVR from this whole study is 96%, and if you remove the eight patients with genotype 4 infection, the overall SVR is still 96%. And as you can see, it didn't much matter whether they had uh, previous uh, treatment with interferon, obviously unsuccessful treatment or not, and it didn't much matter if the patients had cirrhosis or they didn't have cirrhosis, about 20% had cirrhosis in this study. Uh, we also see from this forest plot here that if you look at uh, various uh, potential subgroups or confounders, there was only one subgroup in which there seemed to be some reduced activity of the regimen, and that's in the fourth of bar on the forest plot. So there were uh, uh, about 115 black participants in, in this study, 34% of this uh, study, and uh, they had in this study an SVR rate of 90% compared with 99% in the in non-black subjects. This was uh, probably due to a uh, the uh, convergence of, a, a, of multiple risk, uh, negative risk predictors of SVR in this study uh, because in the IN1, 2, and 3 studies, which involved hepatitis C mono-infected patients, uh, there was no reduced SVR in, in black participants in those studies. So that's probably what happened here. But regardless, even if there was a true finding at 90%, it's a pretty good result. If that was the worst case scenario, it's, it's, it's pretty respectable. But overall, the results were, were quite, uh, uh, quite good in this study. Now, the data on the, uh, on the AbbVie regimen that has three direct acting antivirals with ritonavir boosting and, and ribavirin. Uh, you can see on the left in these multiple red panels the SVR rates with this regimen in, in hepatitis C genotype 1 mono-infected population. You can see they range from 92 to 99 percent. In the uh, HIV co-infected, we only at this point have a small pilot study called Turquoise 1 in which there were 31 patients treated with this regimen for 12 weeks. There were others treated for 24 weeks who also did well, but the regimen that's really approved is a 12-week regimen. So it's based on 31 patients. The results are very good, as you can see. Um, and. Uh, uh, um, there's also a combination uh, not yet approved uh, with uh, uh, sofosbuvir with decladasvir, uh, which is similar conceptually to what I showed you with sofosbuvir ledipasvir, because decladasvir, like ledipasvir, is an NS5A inhibitor. And so you see quite similar SVR rates with this regimen as well, but we've learned that eight weeks is clearly an inadequate duration of therapy. So those are the data uh, in a very, very simple presentation of the data which form the basis of these recommendations which are, are being proposed and for discussion. So for genotype 1, uh, treatment naive, that is hepatitis C treatment naive, uh, recommendation is sofosbuvir, lidivisvir, co-formulation, one uh, a day uh, for 12 weeks. It's a short regimen, high probability of SVR uh, with uh, uh, 
relatively few drug-drug interactions. This is a uh, class one level B recommendation. And then uh, the alternative is uh, uh, paratapravir, ambitazvir, rutonavir, dasabivir, ribavirin uh, for 12 weeks as well. Also high uh, SVR rates. Uh, this regimen does present more challenges with respect to drug-drug interactions, which I'm sure you'll hear about later uh, during this, this session. And because of the smaller number of patients, this is a class one level C recommendation. And uh, Curtis, shall we have a pause for comments or discussion, or do we do the treatment experience next and then pause? Why don't we do that? Okay, we will do that. So the next recommendation is for hepatitis C genotype 1 infection in the HIV co-infected. And these are for patients who failed a previous treatment course. Uh, with pardon? Yeah, with interferon-containing therapy. So we've seen the data uh, on the IN4 trial I showed you uh, that about 55% uh, of the patients had failed prior treatment, and the results were just as good. So therefore, it's the same recommendation with a class one level B recommendation. In the case of the uh, of the uh, AV regimen, there were also some treatment experience patients in in that study as well. Uh, the thing to be aware of is that. Uh, we know uh, with, uh, with confidence that the, uh, the sulfosvir, lidipasvir regimen works even in patients who failed the previous uh, uh, protease inhibitor-based therapy with or without pr uh, protease mut uh, mutations in the NS3 region. We don't have that data for the AVI regimen. In the AVI programs, patients who were previously exposed to a protease inhibitor were excluded because of the concern that a protease uh, NS3 mutation might uh, reduce the activity of the paratapravir in the regimen, which is an NS3 protease inhibitor. So on the basis of that, the recommendation is if patients have failed uh, PEG and RIBA without a protease inhibitor, then either of these two regimens can be used. But if they failed uh, a regimen containing a protease inhibitor, we would recommend only the use of the sulfosivir, lidipasvir regimen based on the data that we have to date. So would this be a time to, yeah. to, uh, to just, pause? Uh, yeah. Just I want to make a, a point. We focused on the SVR rates. We haven't talked about the safety and tolerance pro profile. Um, and that's for the reason that these regimens uh, are all very well tolerated. They have an excellent safety profile. Um, so that, that's sort of assumed. And I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of that. Compared to previous interferon-based yeah. therapies, um, they're, they're far, far better uh, uh, treatments for, for patients. I just wanted also to point out that there's a separate recommendation for duration of therapy depending on whether the patient has prior cirrhosis and a treatment sure. failure that is embedded in this um, recommendation True. that they should receive 24 weeks of therapy. Uh, and this is not due to data we have in HIV co-infection right. to date, but I think it's important particularly for when we're requesting reimbursement for patients. Yes, and, that's, and that would make it congruent with the existing uh, label for uh, which is based uh, on larger numbers of patients with hep C genotype 1 mono infection. Steve, I think we should review treatment naive individuals. Uh, in, the, in the current availability in British Columbia for genotype 1 hepatitis C patients, there's an eight week regimen that's uh, yeah. yes. recommended for individuals with low viral load, so less than 6 million and right. low fibrosis scores. Right. Um, and so if you're applying in British Columbia, that's what you're going to get. And the question really comes now for co-infection, where we have right. no data right. for eight weeks, do we True. push and try and get 12 weeks? I, see. I think we need to have a statement well, addressing the gaps in data in this setting. Yeah, I think you, you're right about that. Uh, in Alberta, we would get to 12 weeks. But uh, so just to bring everyone up to speed, uh, in, from the IN1, 2, and 3 programs in hep C, G1 mono infection, it was shown that for treatment naive patients who do not have cirrhosis, uh, um, eight-week uh, regimen had very high SVRs, uh, and uh, the relapse rates were under 2% if the baseline viral load was below 6 million. And therefore, that is the regimen that is publicly funded in, those, in most provinces uh, because it saves one-third of the costs. And that was not tested in the IN4 study in the co-infected population. And when we look at the LI3 uh, data I showed you, which uses eight weeks of a sulfosamir with a different NS5A inhibitor, it would make me nervous to offer an eight-week regimen to a co-infected patient. Good point, yeah. Any uh, comments from the audience? 
Oh, we have one. Hugo. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on the uh, treatment of co-infected pregnant women. Uh, the treatment of co-infected uh, pregnant women. Well, we I, first of all, the panel never uh, contemplated that specific question, so I'll give you a personal opinion and uh, and then let the others <coughs> wade in. Uh, I, I wouldn't, given the short duration of hepatitis C treatment, which is eight week, is twelve weeks, excuse me, for the majority of patients, uh, it would. Uh, I, I would never electively undertake anti-HCV therapy during a pregnancy. Okay. Um, uh, so that wouldn't do. We also know ribavirin is a teratogen, so any regimen containing ribavirin is a big problem. Um, and of course, we don't have safety and efficacy da data. I mean, the, the, the biggest problem I would have if I ever had it, and I hope I don't, is if I had a patient on a non-ribavirin containing regimen who started when not pregnant and became pregnant in the middle of therapy. I'm not totally sure how I'd handle that scenario. But I, I mean, electively, I don't see any reason. Uh, treatment of hepatitis C is elective or semi-elective in almost all cases. It's never emergent, so I would defer starting a pregnant patient. Maybe I'll ask, open it up to others, yeah. please. So um, I agree that, that interferon's a no-go, ribavirin's a no-go, and there's no data. Uh, there's no reason to suggest that any of these newer medications cause problems during pregnancy, but we don't know. So uh, I, I would be reluctant to expose any woman. I think a big issue is now is hopefully we will be expanding therapy to, to more individuals. We need to be sure that we address uh, pregnancy in women who are pregnancy uh, potential age, as well as uh, to uh, their male partners who are starting with therapy. Yeah, and I think just to add to it, it came up in another session during this meeting that one of the possibly recommendations would be around pregnancy planning mm -hmm. and, and certainly in co-infection where we know there's an increased rate of hepatitis C transmission, uh, that it, it would, should be something that be undertaken with a women of childbearing age that they could consider undertaking hepatitis C treatment earlier in order to prevent possible later perinatal transmission. Our problem will probably arise across different jurisdictions if there are reimbursement issues that are related to level of fibrosis because many of the yes. women yes. who are of childbearing age tend to have quite lower levels of fibrosis due to their age and their gender and then um, might not be eligible under prudential guidelines and whether we can advocate at all for the t making treatment available in a timely way to those women to prevent for co-infected women in particular I think it's something we should consider. I, th I think when I think those are all very important things, and I think we should think about adding a section for pregnancy planning in the guidelines, uh, specifically to address these questions. Uh, and I think we also have to recognize the transmission uh, possibilities and co-infection, as you mentioned as well. Mm -hmm. I think one of the sections that we've completely not put in, and Curtis and I were talking about this earlier, is what are we going to recommend for people who fail a 12-week course of phospholipidosphere? Um, do we well. have any recommendations for retreatment? Uh, in well, the iron four protocol, there were re well, there was a protocol there, for retreatment, but we don't have data yet. So there's any yeah. co infection? Well, I mean, we have to be mindful of the time as well. There was the first data set presented on that at, uh, at Easel about uh, last last week. And there's just a little bit of data, and I'm not sure this is the time yet with these small numbers to make that recommendation. Uh, you know, the, the good news is it's going to be a smaller problem in the future. The failure rates with all of these new interferon-free regimens are so low that I must say I sometimes sit in conversations where, 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 where the perfect is the enemy of the good. We have 96 percent SVR rates uh, and we're, we're spending maybe disproportionate amount of time on the 4 percent. You know, we would have, uh, we would have given anything for 96 percent SVR rate uh, a year and a half ago. Uh, I'll just do the last slide of my section before passing on. So we're, we're making an active statement about regimens for uh, uh, hepatitis C uh, G1 that we uh, we are actively recommending that shouldn't be used because they're they're basically outdated and supplanted by regimens that are in, are in most cases both more efficacious and better tolerated. So dual therapy with pegriba isn't recommended. Triple therapy with pegriba and any DAA isn't recommended, and the regimen that I will call a placeholder regimen of sofosbuvir plus semeprevir, 
which was used for a while because of its availability and, well, for a lucky few. We've now seen data from a phase three trial that suggests that the SVR rates, while respectable, are not as good as what we get uh, with, uh, with our preferred recommendations. So that's why we're making the recommendation that they not be used on a go-forward basis. And I'll turn that over uh, to uh, Dr. Barrett. So before I start, just, just a quick comment on something that you had mentioned about F staging and getting access. So I think that's something to come back at the end to talk about in terms of uh, reimbursement and access to care um, after we get through the, uh, what is not the meat, but uh, from a data perspective, genotypes 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, which I'm going to talk about in three minutes, I'm told, um, are more the lettuce and tomato from a data perspective. So uh, not, not only do we have um, less data in these genotypes, um, but certainly uh, the data is extrapolated from the mono-infect population to the co-infect population. For those of you who don't do this every day, genotype 1 is the most common, but uh, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 exist in Canada, 2 and 3 being more common than 4. And 2 and 3, for those of you who have treated um, hepatitis C in the past with interferon-based regimens, kind of got lumped in together as being easier to treat, and 4 was different. So 1 and 4 were similar. That really hasn't changed too much. But what we have realized is that there's a difference between genotype 2 and 3, even with the new direct-acting antiviral agents. Um, and so the data that we have here is based, again, from the mono-infect population for the most part. I've concentrated on the regimens that are currently approved in Canada from a compound perspective, but some of the indications that I mentioned are not necessarily approved. So that's a caveat as we go forward. Um, and I think the data slides are actually before the recommendations here. Yeah. So genotype, um, you heard about a couple of different compounds that were mentioned for genotype 1. Uh, for genotypes 2 and 3, which are the first ones that we'll mention, um, there is no mention of the, the uh, 3D combination of paratapavir, ambitasvir, and disapavir because it's not approved uh, for use in genotypes 2 and 3 because it doesn't work. So this is data uh, on genotype 2 patients. And again, I think that this is a theme that we should mention and, and make sure it's clear in the guidelines. Treatment um, response rates or cure are stratify, stratified at the current time by whether or not you've been treated in the past, so whether you're treatment naive or experienced, and by the, whether or not you're cirrhotic or not. So there are decreased response rates in some treatment experienced individuals and some cirrhotic patients. Although, when you look across the board here, uh, complex slide, the solid bars are people who are non-cirrhotic, less advanced liver disease, the stripy bits are the cirrhotic patients. Uh, and on what you see here is SVR12, or what we've sort of called cure these days. Um, all of these data from phys fission, positron, valence, uh, fusion, and Lone Star are mono-infect populations, and the numbers of patients, as you can see here, are not humongous when you look at genotype two and three. Um, in fact, you're in the 60 range, 10 patients, et cetera, et cetera. Two patients in the valence study there in the cirrhotic group. So overall, it's, it's pretty easy to see that response rates greater than 95% in almost all groups, whether treatment naive or not, with treatment with SOF and ribavirin for 12 weeks on the left there. And then on the right in the treatment experience group, there's a conspicuous you might say, bar of in the fusion group of soft riva for 12 weeks um, in the cirrhotic individuals. On the right, there's the Lone Star study, which was soft peg riva um, for 12 weeks. And you can see there uh, all of those treatment experienced uh, individuals who were non cirrhotic responded, and still above 90% of the individuals who were cirrhotic responded as well. And that comes into play when we look at some of the recommendations. So, again, SOF and RIVA is the, uh, uh, one of the cornerstones here of what we're recommending, and then PEG RIVA on the end in a 12 week regimen. As I've mentioned, we've stratified people by treatment naive or experienced, but as well the cirrhotics play a role, as already mentioned. Um, so the cefospivir uh, once daily with ribavirin for 12 weeks with the consideration to extend to 16 weeks in cirrhotics, whether or not you're treatment naive or experienced. And that's a class one level B based on the data that you've just seen from mono infects in small numbers of patients. Do you wanna go ahead and do the two, two three, four, five, six? Yeah, okay, I'll keep going to the other billion genotypes that I'm going to do quickly. 
Um, so genotype 3, as I've mentioned, and as we know, actually in co-infect patients is probably a little bit of a different disease, uh, rapidly progressive fibrosis in some individuals, particularly with HIV co-infection. And so um, although we've extrapolated data from the mono-infect population, this may or may not be quite as valid, and we have some data but not a ton to, to uh, validate that. Again, similar sort of setup for this slide, and I am talking about SOF and RIBA as well as PEG interferon RIBA on the very bars on the very end. Um, and as you can see, genotype 3 is a bit of a soft spot um, for soft-based uh, regimens. Um, fission, positron, and valence. In the valence study, actually, at 24 weeks, soft and RIBA were uh, very well tolerated. On the right, you've got the uh, treatment-experienced individuals, uh, which, quite frankly, wasn't um, that different. When you add in PEG, interferon, and ribavirin, the response rates became much better, and that's where we're going to go ahead and look at. Oh, and this was the most recent data, sorry. This came from EASL this year, actually. This is the boson study. Um, and in genotype 3 patients, again, SBR12 approximating cure, it was a, a difference of soft RIBA for 24 weeks in the blue bars versus the orange bars with soft PEG RIBA for 12 weeks, so bringing back down the duration of therapy to something that's comparable to what you would see in genotype 1. Uh, and you can see that the response rates in more reasonable uh, numbered patients, 120, 120 in each, 120 in each group for the known cirrhotics, and in the cirrhotics, 50 to 60 in each group. The response rates are better, um, but still certainly uh, room for improvement, and there is still a clear need for uh, uh, improvements in therapy in genotype three. So these are the recommendations for genotype three treatment naive individuals. We've started with cefospivir once daily with ribavirin and pegylated interferon based on the data that I had just shown you, where the response rates actually do improve. However, uh, cefospivir with weight-based ribavirin for 24 weeks is still included as well. In the treatment experience patient, again, uh, cefospivir and ribavirin for 24 weeks, uh, and I thought we had changed that actually. Anyway, um, and um, cefospivir with pegylated interferon uh, and ribavirin for 12 weeks uh, is still an option. So although we're desperately trying to get away from interferon um, and on occasion ribavirin, clearly in the genotype threes, that's still where we are in terms of giving people the best chance at cure based on the data that we have at this point. Um, and I know there's some more data that's gonna be uh, coming out soon. Um, the electron data, electron two data, I didn't put in there, um, but soft, soft lead and ribavirin may be an option, uh, but the numbers are too small, 20 patients to actually provide a recommendation at this point. Do we want to talk about two and three now and then go on to four? No, we should. Okay, so why don't we talk about two and sure. three right now? And I think there is data in co-infection from the photon study as well, uh, and the numbers actually weren't that bad. Steve, I don't know if you want to discuss pho photon. Oh, well, Photon in, in terms of dual therapy with yeah. Uh, soft riba. Yeah, well, yes, well, soft press riba it, it has been studied in genotypes one, two, three, and four. Um, it performs very well in two, intermediate in three, not in, uh, and not as good in, in one and four. I mean, it was one of the only options available once upon a time if you couldn't use interferon. Um, so. And, and it's been studied in a reasonable number of co-infected individuals. So, I mean, it, 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 well, it's in the recommendations already. So we have data that come from co-infected individuals a, a, as well. So it's, it's a reasonable option. And, and that's in the document as well, in the longer document. I didn't highlight it this morning. There really is a paucity of data uh, in co-infected patients with genotype 2 and 3, and so this is really is based heavily on mono-infection data. Um, and although it is important to state that with the all oral regimens, the cure rates uh, are very similar, if not identical, to in co-infected populations compared to mono-infection. So, so we feel relatively comfortable in extrapolating from mono-infection data, but uh, it would uh, be preferable if we, we had the data. There's a couple of regimens that are left off of the, the list. There is a small amount of mono-infection data with cefosfavir plus decladosphere, um, but at, at this point we haven't included that because A, it's not Health Canada approved, 
and the costs of that regimen would prove to be prohibitive for most individuals. There is emerging data in the mono-infected population that sofosavir, ledipasvir, plus ribavirin in genotype 3 um, is an effective regimen. But again, that is in mono-infected populations in small numbers. There is a Canadian study uh, that is uh, soon to be initiated that will look further into that question. But again, uh, be, we'll have to discuss whether we want to uh, uh, how, whether we want to include those uh, in our recommendations or I mean, not. It's, it's 25, 25 patients from Electron 2 yeah. with, with yeah. that. So I, so, sorry, uh, Curtis, yeah. you, you, you talked about sofosphere and Ducladosphere, and it, it isn't Health Canada approved now, but there's a good probability it'll be a Health Canada approved regimen uh, sometime in the next 30 days. So uh, by the time we get this document uh, finalized, it may need to be addressed. And the Ally 3 uh, study showed that sofosphere uh, Ducladosphere in G three mono infected performed extremely well if patients didn't have cirrhosis, but it didn't perform very well with cirrhosis. So at 12 weeks in non cirrhotics, it may be a cost competitive regimen, yeah. but at 24, don't think so. Okay, I think Reed has a yeah. It's uh, Reed Semenuk from Toronto. Um, my question is, I guess stepping back, you know, I'm hearing a lot of concerns about imprecision and indirectness from. Uh, some of these things from a small number of events and from uh, mono-infected patient studies. Um, but I guess my question is to the whole panel, why did you guys choose this uh, system for grading the evidence as opposed to something that can take into account uh, precision and directness, other things like inconsistency, like grade, which, which has stronger validation? That's a good question. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I mean, it's comparable to the other guidelines that are available yeah. currently in Canada. The, the most recent Canadian guidelines came out, and I joined this group late. I think I was just invited because I'm tall. I don't know, I had to, there was a height requirement for some. <laughs> I'm just balancing out the table. Um, but uh, but I, I, I mean, I think that's not a bad thing to have a comparability aspect to it. But. Yeah. I mean, the rating system that... that we use, we didn't create it. It's, it was created many years ago and been used for multiple guidelines, not exclusively in the area of antiviral therapy either. So, but it doesn't make it a perfect uh, set of guidelines. Yeah, and I think the other thing ratings. to mention is that the, in most of these cases, we're talking one randomized controlled trial for this regimen. So, there, you know, you don't get any more information probably from that except to provide some evidence about the quality of that cry, that. Trial. I guess my point is just that they're all class one, but you could, you know, you could write down for okay. those things with grade, which, would, which I think would be helpful for clinicians. Great, thanks. We're going to move on to genotype four. <laughs> right. Okay. So I'm not going to show you a ton of data about genotype four. Again, um, for the sofosbuvir based regimens, the recommendations are fairly clear, and the document itself has a lot of the guidelines and the studies that have been included based on genotype four data. However, um, there is an, an inclusion of a recommendation for genotype four, which is not approved by Health Canada, and that's why I've included the next data slide, um, which is. Here, this is um, we've included um, the umbitisvir paratapravir uh, combination uh, with, ribo with ribavirin for genotype four, as is congruent with some other recommendations worldwide. Um, however, again, this is not a Health Canada recommendation at the moment, and I've included the data. It's based on uh, about 80 patients, and what you're looking at in each of these bars here, don't be confused. The light blue one on in each group is what you need to see, which is SVR12 or Cure. Uh, and in that case, you could see that treatment naive or not, the response rates were uh, excellent to this combination in genotype 4 in a small number of patients. And therefore, these are the recommendations. Uh, again, the document that we've created has more information on the data, um, but it's much more akin to the, to the genotype 1 situation. So um, the paratapavir, ritonavir, ombudsvir, and weight-based ribavirin without disapavir for 12 weeks is uh, something that we've recommended based on a small amount of data, but also in, in emerging data that's coming along. Um, these are also Health Canada approved, just not the indication. And then um, sofosbuvir with pegylated interferon riba for 12 weeks, um, which is based on mono-infection studies. Soft and lead uh, for 12, 12 weeks, one pill once a day. And then uh, sofosbuvir with weight-based ribavirin for 24 weeks. Uh, so there are multiple options for genotype 4, uh, and the response rates are much uh, better than what you would see in the context of genotype 2 or 3. Uh, and I haven't gone into all that data because it is much more akin to genotype 1. Questions? 
Okay, great. I'll just fly through these. Oh, there's no six. Yeah, there is uh, next to no data with genotype fives and sixes uh, in co-infection or for that matter in mono-infection. So uh, uh, in general, uh, you, uh, you need to consult an expert. <laughs> So I'm just going to go through uh, some stuff in regards to acute hep C and subsequently some adverse uh, events. Uh, these are Dr. Conway's slides uh, on acute hepatitis C infection. Uh, I notice that there's no grading on any on either of these. Um, so uh, patients participating in high risk activities uh, for hepatitis C or I guess acquisition of hepatitis C and presenting with signs and symptoms of acute infection should be screened and initiation of antiviral therapy during the acute period of hepatitis C infection optimizes cure rates and potentially reduces community incidence. Okay, this is worth discussion. These are not my slides. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> so just to put a little bit of uh, you know, backdrop on this, historically, uh, if you were able to treat uh, acute hepatitis C infection within the first six months after exposure with interferon plus or minus ribavirin, the SVR rates uh, were quite high, you know, in the range of 70 or 80 percent, depending on the cohort that you evaluate. If you waited until after six months, then the SVR rates would drop to below 50 percent for genotype 1 infection, so about 40 percent. Um, so it made sense to try and identify these acutely infected individuals and get them on therapy to maximize their chance of cure. Keep in mind as well that during the period of acute infection, there is a 15 to 20 percent likelihood that the person will spontaneously clear their uh, acute infection and will not uh, develop chronic hepatitis C infection. So now let's move into an interferon-free era where if somebody presents with acute infection, um, if, uh, if you offer them antiviral therapy with, with uh, uh, the combination uh, oral interferon-free regimens, the anticipated cure rate would be 90 percent plus, um, which is what you'd expect whether you treated them during their acute infection or whether you treated them down the road. So, one option is to wait the six months, see who's going to spontaneously clear their infection so that you don't have to expose them to medications, and then anybody who is established to have chronic infection, then try to get them on therapy, with the big caveat being that getting funding for that therapy would probably prove to be very difficult because they would have insufficient fibrosis to meet uh, most uh, uh, provincial uh, um, formulary requirements. So that's why this is a, uh, a point of uncertainty in the guidelines. Any other? I, I right think now. that, so the one issue now that we face is the issue of reducing transmission so that people who become acutely infected are clearly engaging in activities that allow them to become infected and possibly transmit. So, so that's that balance between can you identify someone who's infectious and likely to transmit and through treatment reduce that risk. Mm -hmm. But that's an area of ongoing mm -hmm. um, debate and um, well, there's lots of modeling that suggests that that's an important, might be an attractive approach. I think we're in a position where funding treatment in this situation is, is a real challenge. Mm -hmm. And I don't know even that the mono-infection guidelines have come down quite clearly on what to do in this situation. And I think it's, it remains a gray zone that I th we need to highlight as, as an issue in the guidelines, I think, but I don't know that we can come with a definitive statement because uh, in, the patients will not have advanced, if you wait six months, they're not going to have fibrosis and so they probably won't be treated for many years, right? Another important thing to consider in this issue is it's those people with acute infection who are still actively participating in high-risk activities, which uh, creates a situation where others might also become infected. So, oh, you did? Oh, okay. So, okay. Go ahead, Lisa. Okay, I think there is something you can comment. Yeah, and it's exactly what you said. It's an individual situation. If somebody is at high risk for transmission, you treat them. And, and number two, this comes back to this is this is co-infection guidelines, and everybody should get treated regardless of F designation. 
I think. So um, actually, I don't think that we, we, we know that most of this data is from people with early, early fibrosis. And although the provinces have instituted this, I don't think that's a data-based recommendation. So everybody who has co-infection should be at least considered. And in an individual situation where transmission is an option, then they should be treated, period. Just one more comment about acute infection. From a, we, we know from the interferon era that if you chose to treat early, as Curtis indicated, you could get a. Not only were the cure rates higher, the duration of therapy could be shorter, and it was it was debate whether you even needed ribavirin. So the host was more primed to clear infection. And there's some pilot studies ongoing now that with DAAs to see if you can go shorter than the eight and twelve weeks that we're using now. These are research questions, okay? I'm not endorsing a shorter duration, but in acute infection, it may well be true that a much more abbreviated course of an all oral regimen will, will, will get rid of infection. R remains to be determined. Okay, so I'm just gonna go through these last couple slides so that we can get to drug-drug interactions. Um, so in regards to adverse events, um, we s recommend that close monitoring for side effects during therapy uh, be uh, provided and subsequently uh, that anemia related to treatment for hepatitis C be primarily managed uh, with ribavirin dose reduction and EPO should not be uh, recommended as first line management for those who develop anemia uh, with uh, hepatitis C therapy. And quickly, uh, adherence plan should be developed for all patients initiating hepatitis C therapy. So I'm gonna leave it now to Alice. Again, we could probably <clears throat> spend hours talking about some of these points. Um, this will be posted for all of our most of May. So if anyone or any of your friends want to comment on this, uh, it, it'll be posted on the uh, CTN site. Okay, thanks. So I'll just uh, run through the next section that uh, both uh, Pierre and myself uh, worked on. Uh, so more things change, some things stay the same, and uh, this is a, a, a repeat from previous iterations of the guidelines that we still need to pay close attention to drug-drug interactions between the hepatitis C antivirals and concomitant uh, HIV and non-HIV medications um, because of the, the consequences, uh, including a suboptimal viral response, development of resistance, and, uh, and drug toxicities. Um, in terms of our recommendations for uh, antiretroviral options for, for um, uh, people requiring hepatitis C treatment uh, guidelines, we, we base them according to uh, type of regimen being used. So for individuals with genotype 1 who are going to initiate therapy with cefosivir lidiposphere, um, most traditional first-line antiretroviral options may be used. Uh, just a note that if... Um, uh, the regimen includes a ritonavir or cobicistat uh, boosting agent uh, in conjunction with tenofovir, then uh, additional monitoring of renal function is recommended uh, because of the potential for increased uh, tenofovir exposures, uh, or alternatively, a an alternate nucleoside backbone could be considered. Do you want to do, comment? Do we, do we want to talk about that? Oh, well, there's, a, there's oh, you can talk, but I was actually going to raise another question, so. Oh. Um. Uh, it, it's the uh, the question about uh, uh, increased tenofovir levels. Uh, anybody have a strong opinions one way or another with that? Yeah, because there, there are there are some discrepancies between the U.S. guidelines and, or the U U.S. monograph and the Canadian monograph in terms of uh, how much weight or how much concern. I think the Americans are, are, go a bit stronger in terms of recommending alternative choices, even which you know I think most of us think that's maybe a bit too, the, those, too drastic. Those, those recommendations were made prior to, to Ion4 data being presented, mm -hmm. and uh, in, in that study of of 335 co-infected patients. There was no evidence of, of renal toxicity resulting from that, so. Yeah, um, I, I, but I, I, yeah I guess the difference is that the IN4, because of the, P, it, was, it was enrolled with the PK interactions that were known at the time, so neither ritonavir or co, nor COBE boosted regimen, HIV regimens were permitted. On the other hand, efavirenz was used in it roughly yeah, half the patients in IN4, and efavirenz results in roughly doubling of tenofovir exposure, and there was no 
you know, signaled in the, in the Favarin's arm that looked different from the other arms of that trial. So it may be that, you know, some in, a modest increased exposure up to doubling is not associated with clinically evident toxicity. Right, and I think yeah, the, Can the, the Canadian monograph does reflect more of that, uh, more of that consideration. And uh, you know, I, I think you've got, if you have a patient who doesn't have any additional risk factors for, for nephrotoxicity, it's probably not a, uh, you know, it shouldn't be a significant uh, deterrent. The other issue I wanted to raise was one that came up at CROI this year regarding atazanavir and uh, lidipasvir regimen. So that does, it, it wasn't, it's kind of indirect evidence, but there's some suggestion that the levels are increased in the mm -hmm. setting, and that uh, there are certainly increased rates of hyperbilirubinemia, not to the point that was treatment limiting, but mm -hmm. um, I think it's something that we ought to highlight as okay. mentioning could take place. Yeah. Okay, pushing through. Uh, for individuals with genotype 1 who uh, initiate treatment with a 3D regimen, um, uh, atazanavir without additional ritonavir booster, raltagavir, or dolutegavir may be, may be used. Um, other uh, treatment options uh, may uh, be associated with significant interactions. If you have somebody uh, co-infected who is already stable on, on an uh, HIV regimen that is not one of these recommended options, um, if it's possible to switch to something that, that is, is preferable from a drug interaction standpoint, obviously that would be ideal. Uh, if you have patients with uh, multi-drug resistance who, who, you know, your options are a bit more limited, uh, certainly uh, treatment uh, for hep C can be considered, but uh, should definitely be done in consultation with um, expert physician and pharmacists who, who are able to manage both the, the uh, resistant HIV and the, the complex drug interactions. Um, I think this is an important uh, thing to be aware of, is that they continue, there's also risk of uh, interactions between uh, the, the directly acting antivirals and other drug classes. And so uh, it is important to um, uh, do, do a thorough assessment and monitoring uh, both at baseline and uh, as well as frequent intervals uh, throughout a hepatitis C treatment. I think one very important point is, is uh, to ensure that your medication records are up to date and that you do have a complete medical history. Um, one of the, you know, just as a recent example, the, the warning letter about the amiodarone uh, uh, toxicity in, in patients on a sofosavir plus DAA regimen, I think highlights this very, uh, th this exact fact is that, you know, not all drug interactions are known. Uh, a lot of uh, potential drug interactions may involve drug transporters, which aren't as well uh, elucidated for, for many other drug classes. So uh, just to be aware and, and to, to really keep a close eye, certainly to consult any uh, hepatitis C uh, specific uh, drug interaction resources uh, if possible. And then, uh, again, this is a repeat from the previous guidelines, but if uh, there are any non-essential medications which can be discontinued during the course of DAA uh, treatment, uh, you know, just that would be great just for, to simplify and avoid drug interactions. Thanks. Hey, it's me. <laughs> okay, we're uh, almost done. Uh, we are going to talk about HIV and liver transplantation now. Okay. Um, HIV hepatitis C co-infected patients should be considered for liver transplantation, assuming all necessary criteria are met, and this is a recommendation that is unchanged from previous guidelines. Hepatitis C antiviral therapy should be considered in post-liver transplant recipients. Um, this is an expert uh, opinion. There is no data uh, studying the hep C oral agents in co-infected post-liver transplant recipients, but there is now ample data in mono-infected post-liver transplant recipients demonstrating safety, tolerability, um, and a very high uh, uh, SVR rate. So that was easy. So <laughs> that, that is it as far as the uh, current recommendations, as I think was probably uh, suggested uh, in our banter back and forth, we'll, we'll be adding additional ones. Questions from the audience or, or discussion from the committee? We'll start with uh, Terry's question. Hi, uh, Terry Howard, Positive Living, BC. Um, 
And Positive Living, for those of you who don't know, is a community-based organization that offers support services for people living with HIV. I think you're all aware that uh, we're facing, as community organizations, more and more pressure to include both mono-infected and co-infected um, programming into our already very busy stable of programming, um, or risk losing funding or not getting renewed funding to provide support services. So that puts a, an amazing burden on us. Um, I think that you're all aware, obviously, Alex referred to multidisciplinary care in terms of people that go on to infection, but I'm wondering if um, you know, you've considered the amazing an amount of uh, social support around social determinants that people require not only when they're on treatment, but often uh, is the leading up factor to pe people becoming infected in the first place. And I'm wondering if you've considered including in your guidelines in an official way a push for clinicians to hook up with community organizations and making it an official thing because that any kind of a push to connect with a community organization to provide those services would be a huge help. So um, I guess what I'm asking is, can you help a brother out? <laughs> yes. Um, there, there is a large section in the, uh, the, the first quarter of the document that talks about the importance of multidisciplinary care, uh, engaging our community partners. If you happen to work in a, uh, and provide care in an academic centre, uh, and the importance of engaging marginalised uh, and remote patients. So th that's all in there. We'll, of course, uh, examine it, and you, of course, can examine the document and uh, provide us uh, with your thoughts uh, th through that mechanism as well. Okay, okay. we have somebody there. Hi, everyone. Um, Hello. Uh, my name is Christian Hoy. I'm from the Global oh, Network. And by the way, can I ask just Really succinct sure. questions. Of okay, um, at the uh, uh, recent uh, Hep C for uh, Immigrants workshop uh, provided by the Canadian Society for International Health and the Global HCV Network, uh, it was suggested that uh, immigrants and migrants actually are more at risk for uh, viral hepatitis and uh, liver cancers. So uh, I missed the opportunity to pose the questions when you uh, were talking about the treatment screening. Uh, I mean, not the treatment screening, the screening for HCV. Uh, does your panels plan to investigate whether that may be something you would consider, uh, given that um, the migrants and immigrants, they actually may contract HCV uh, unrelated to substance use? Um, yes, we, uh, that you are right. Uh, the immigrant population is a very important population to a screen. Uh, to screen and that'll ensure that they're engaged in care uh, earlier. Uh, I recently did an evaluation at our own program and at least in the Ottawa region there's a 16 year period of time that passes from the time of immigration to the time when they uh, reach uh, hepatitis C care and that's obviously too long. I think these are very important for mono-infected uh, guidelines. I mean we recommend that all co-infected patients are screened and I think that would incorporate immigrants as a risk group. I don't think we specifically identify it as a risk group, but maybe we should add some language to that effect. But I think our, rec our screening recommendations are pretty strong. Okay. Um, Fiona Smail, Hamilton. Um, do you have any particular recommendations about the experience and expertise of the practitioners that now will be treating hepatitis C with these uh, new drugs? I, we don't, I think it's an excellent question, Fiona, is that we think that um, treatment will expand to a broader range of practitioners ultimately. Again, these are co-infection guidelines and so um, uh, principally people are accessing care through at least their HIV service providers to start with. Um, but I think um, we, um, uh, and the complexities currently with respect to the drug interactions and the other issues, I think at the moment are probably likely to remain in, in a specialized setting. That doesn't mean that they have to be infectious disease or hepatology specialists, but at least uh, specialized in the delivery of HIV care uh, to some extent, yeah. but other panelists may have. Sure. Just a further comment on this. If we look at the big picture of hepatitis C in Canada, it's estimated there's about 250,000 Canadians living with hepatitis C. 
uh, up to now, there's probably never been more than five or 6,000 uh, patients treated per year, and until recently, the cure rates were not all that great. So if we sit back and look at the big picture of hep C in Canada, that includes people, the majority of whom will happen to be mono-infected, but I'm including everybody, if we want to make a serious dent in it, we, we will have to expand beyond the limited number of people who are treating hepatitis C up to now, most of who have significant waiting lists to be seen. So if we want to look at the big picture, we definitely have to change uh, from the status quo. Okay. Shall we oh, talk to Zidi? Oh. Hi. Um, hi, Curtis. It's Linda. I have a quick question. <laughs> um, well, one of our GI specialists in town, because we're just really kind of ramping up our co-infect treatment in our clinic now in Windsor, but one of our GI people say that in our cirrhotics, after cure or before cure, um, the routine monitoring would also include alpha feta protein, and I noticed you guys never said anything about that. <laughs> is that gone out of the like out of vogue now, or is, it, is ultrasound more, just sufficient enough to uh, monitor your patients for you know? Hey, hey, the issue of AFP screening is uh, is uh, really controversial. It's unclear, and we actually at this point axed it for what it was in the previous guidelines. And uh, the, at least the, the, our current thinking is to not include that. Yeah, it, there's quite a bit of controversy about it. I think that, again, it comes to the issue of how available is ultrasound in your local environment. So there are people for whom it's very difficult to get and be sure of an annual ultrasound or a six-monthly ultrasound. And in those instances, you may use it as an a poor person's marker, uh, it, it, there's a lot of controversy about yeah. using it as a primary tool exclusively, anyhow. Shelley Tognizzini, Positive Living Society as well. Um, I'm just curious, it begs the question yet to be discussed, and I'm sure those discussions have happened about uh, people that reinfect. And because having come from British Columbia <laughs> and having seen the difference in care from doctor to doctor, I'm curious as to what that will look like, particularly when you're trying to get people on trials that may or may not be, have the food security and the housing and all of the things that are part of the criteria, and yet we're lowering the barrier for those that are in active addiction. <laughs> Go ahead, Lisa. I, understand, I, understand. <laughs> I appreciate, Lisa, that you said everyone should be treated. I absolutely agree. However, I'm curious, is this gonna be three strikes you're out? And what are we going to do for those that were not prepared emotionally, psychologically, to be on treatment in the first place? Right, so, so that's a complicated question. Um, and, and most of what I'm about to say is, 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 an, is an opinion based on some data, but not necessarily that of the whole guidelines committee. But I do think everyone should be treated, and that's, that's data-based. We know that people get sicker with HIV, hep C co-infection, people should be treated. Uh, we know that people do better when they're treated earlier in the course of their liver disease, um, and therefore you should get access to care no matter what your F, whatever the heck it is. The only reason we need to know about the stage of your liver disease is to determine the type and duration of treatment, and anything else that's been implemented has been as a sort of gateway to, to, to sort of prioritizing who gets treated first. So coming to your question, I think when you say everyone should be treated, everyone should be treated in a model of care. Hepatitis C treatment, these are treatment guidelines, but they really are care guidelines or should be. So in order to treat people who are at high risk for reinfection, you need to do that in the context of an excellent model of care that includes harm reduction if they're at high risk for reinfection. And having said that, um, that means that we have to change the way that we deliver care, and that's a bigger question. But I think the guidelines and the document as it stands um, advocate for that. Whether that will happen at the provincial level, to me, is not clear. We're certainly advocating for it on the East Coast. Okay. I think that's an excellent way to uh, wrap up the session. Um, so <laughs> thank you very much for uh, participating. Once again, it will be posted for uh, the majority of May, right till the end of May, so please provide your feedback that way or approach me, Mark, or anybody else on the writing committee. Okay, thanks. Oh, and by the way, remember, the clinical science session at 3 o'clock is in this room. Okay. Hi.